Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast, brought to you by the Wealthy Speaker School. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson. Today, we are talking about delivering virtual keynotes. I'm so excited. We have Rohit Bhargava with us. Welcome, Rohit. Thank you. I'm excited too. Oh, this is so fun. I feel so fortunate to know the people that I know in this industry. Chris Young and Renee Strom uh, worked together in a speakers bureau a hundred years ago. They are both um, <laughs> communicating about you these days. Renee, I think rep- represents you. She does. And, yeah. uh, and I was asking Chris, you know, who's really hot doing a lot of virtual keynoting these days? And your name came to the top of the list. And when I went to your website, boom, right on the home page, and we'll put a link in the show notes, was you in in studio. And I thought, well done on the pivot, Rohit. I mean, you yeah. really changed it up almost Not right away. just a studio, by the way, but a socially distanced studio because that's oh. how we recorded. So we actually stayed six feet apart when we did that after the whole thing hit. So it was uh, you yeah. know, very intentional, yeah. Because you have a big camera there. I mean, so the camera operator needs to be there. And I love right. that it's... It, it, and you probably come in through a different door. And I've heard about these setups before. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite interesting, the time that we're living in. Um, talk about kind of the time that you had before you got into speaking. How long have you been speaking and what were you doing before that? So I've probably been speaking for about 10 years. Uh, and I've always been a, a guy who is focused on innovation in some sense. And so uh, I used to work in big global marketing agencies. I was at Ogilvy for eight years. I was at Leo Burnett in Australia before that. I lived in the Philippines. I was born in India. You know, wow. I've been kind of all over, and now I live in Washington, D.C. So awesome. it's sort of this varied perspective because anybody who's worked in a consulting role or in an agency knows you're switching between industries all the time. And so. Right. I would work on American Express in the same day that I would work on Intel in the same day that I would work on, uh, you know, honey bunches of oats. Like that was a typical day, right? So uh, you, you get really good at, at learning what you need to know uh, in the moment you need to know it. I love that. So were you an ad man before Mad Men were cool? <laughs> you know, I have to say Mad Men were probably cool back then, yeah. much more than maybe they, they became <laughs> over time. Uh, but I've always been a storyteller. I mean, that's what I teach at Georgetown. Um, that's, what I, that's what I love doing. And so marketing for me was a great fit because if you're doing it well, you're telling persuasive stories. And so it's not just right. entertainment, right? You're not telling a story to entertain. You're actually trying to persuade somebody to do something. That's why it's marketing. That's why it's an ad. And so for me, like that was just a really interesting background to start doing what I've been doing. And now you have a lot of books under your belt. It said six in your bio, but I actually saw more than six. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and what, what, which one was your number one Wall Street bestseller? Was that um, Megatrends? Yeah, this was uh, here. I've got props just for you. So this, oh, awesome. uh, this one right here, <laughs> um, this one hit number one. Uh, just podcast. Uh, for anybody who's listening, we do have this visually over on YouTube so that you can see Rohit's props, which, <laughs> so yes. that, one, that one was kind of, was that the biggest, how long ago did that uh, book come out? So uh, the latest edition of it um, came mm-hmm. out in January, 2020. Um, right. and that's when it hit number one on the Wall Street Journal list. Uh, but it's actually been a 10 year project for me. So this was the last version but every year I did a new book that was all about trends. And so a lot of what I was speaking about and what I still speak about is how do you see around the corner, put those pieces together and be what I call a non-obvious thinker, which is someone who's innovative, but who isn't close minded. Like how do you be more open-minded, consume more media, think internationally. uh, And then how do you put those pieces together to kind of see what's going to happen next, which I think is totally relevant for right now. Well, 
obviously what you're doing is very important and very needed for right now because being able to see around the corner is something that everybody wants. We're smack dab. Uh, we're about April 16th now. We've been recording these COVID podcasts for quite some time. And I do hope that they'll have some longevity because I think that virtual um, keynoting is probably, it's not like going to happen all now between now and the fourth quarter, and then it's going to go away. I actually think this is going to maybe start up a little bit of a trend. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think we're, we're doing what we need to do. Uh, but I think a lot of what has been happening right now is there's some people are saying, well, there's this new category, right? A virtual keynoting. And I think that thinking that is kind of as if you were saying, well, there's this new category of acting. It's called green screen acting where you're like acting in front of a green screen and any actor will tell you like, well, it's not a new category. Like you're still acting. You're still portraying the, the person. You're just doing it in front of a green screen because everything else gets added later. Right. And I think that now as, as professional keynote speakers, like we're faced with what an actor acting in front of a green screen is faced with, right? No feedback, mm -hmm. no other actors to interact with. And so right. we have to bring all of that energy ourselves, which is harder, but not impossible. Right. And, and you're doing a really great job of it. And I'm going to include, Renee sent me your, I guess we call it your virtual demo, what she sends out to a client if they want to book you virtually. And that's going to become a thing for us here in our industry is that people will want to be able to see before they buy a, a virtual keynote. So be thinking about what your virtual demo might look like, listeners. Um, so let's just dive into what some of you, you talked about bringing the energy. It's not the same as giving a normal presentation, mostly because you're not getting anything back from the audience. And those of us who are used to getting some acknowledgement, like I don't even do yeah. keynotes because I need that like constant interaction and the ping pong to be going back and forth. So talk about, um, well, let's start at the setup. Don't you think that talking to your client and getting the expectations straight is probably job one and then really thinking about how you're going to deliver this in what environment? Yeah, although I will say that that one thing that I found to be very different when I am doing that, that let's call it a sort of planning call, right? Right. Is uh, much more than it used to be when it was an in-person event. Uh, I would really do a lot of listening and say to the client, look, what do you, what have you seen in the past? What does your audience relate mm -hmm. to? What's most important for you? And I would just kind of, I would be taking a lot of notes and Renee would take yeah. a ton of notes too, before we even said, this is what we're going to do. And now what I'm finding is with the virtual ones, they don't know what to do. You're expect. guiding it. More guidance. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I find myself kind of, uh, guiding that conversation a little more and saying, well, look, this is what I've seen does work. This is what I don't think works. And this is how maybe you might want to do it. Mm. And uh, what I'm finding is that that's become really valuable for them because not only do they take that for whatever I'm doing for them, but they can use that now for the rest of whatever they're doing too. Exactly. Because not a lot of decision makers are going to come to the table with this breadth of knowledge, they're really kind of trying to reimagine their own meetings. And mm -hmm. a lot of times they don't exactly know. So it's great. So let me ask you this. When I see the setup that you have on the homepage of your website, uh, that's a studio that you're going to outside of your home that is yep. set up with a cameraman and it's probably going to be somewhat costly for the client. I'm thinking based on what I know about um, a few other people that are doing this type of work right now. And, and for those production houses that have pivoted like Chris's heroic productions, uh, good on you. So you're in Washington somewhere and you go to your studio and then the client is footing the bill for that. Is that how it's working? Yeah, usually, but uh, but I don't necessarily position it in that way, right? Okay. So, um, for example, I mean, if we ever did something that had an all-inclusive fee, like I wouldn't uh, go and say to my client, here's the, you know, uh, $70 for whatever meal I had with somebody else that you're going to pay mm -hmm. for separately. Like nobody right. wants to do it that way. 
So okay. usually what we'll do is we'll figure out as part of the bundle, okay, what's the format that we're going to do? Is it going to be more natural like what we're doing here where I'm going to be sitting there clicking, interacting with people, telling someone that they can raise their hand and, and literally sort of piloting a, a, a call where people can interact? Right. Or do they prefer something that's more like a studio setup where now I go into the studio and then we decide what the, you know, what the format's going to be based on that uh, okay. and then we deliver on it. Okay. And so you might even build the studio right into your fee and uh, just take That's care of it. That's what we always do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, always. Fair enough. Yeah. Because I mean, I'm not a, I've never been a fan of sort of thing. okay, here's the price for this. Here's the price for that. Like I've never been the type of speaker that's like, well, here's my but fee. But you're not nickel and diming the clock. <laughs> you're not nickel and diming the client if it costs you ten thousand dollars to rent that studio. So that's not exactly nickel and dime stuff. I get the meals. I hear where you're coming from, but some of these studios can be quite expensive. If it's fifteen hundred dollars, yeah. sure, maybe you absorb that cost. But fifteen thousand, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you might want to. Well, you can build in a nice package, but anyway, I'm just saying. Um, I recognize yeah, most of our. I mean, I will say, I will tell you. I mean, most of the anybody who's done like a live studio recording like that, if it's a, I mean, there's different scales, right? I mean, if they want a whole set built in like this whole thing, then yeah, it could be pretty expensive. And then of course mm -hmm. the production value of that is something that's added on top. Right, if it's right, right. straight in the studio, regular background, it's generally not as costly okay. to do. Um, and with the fees that we're charging, like, you know, we can incorporate something like that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I gotcha. Okay, so one of the things that I think we need to be clear with our listeners is that the client is still paying for an outcome. They still want to solve a problem or they still want you to help them think differently about something. So that's also where you're starting your conversation with them, right? Yeah. And I think that uh, the challenges have maybe shifted a little. And so one mm -hmm. of the ways that we've shifted our thinking is uh, before maybe they would say, okay, we want to bring you in for a keynote. What you're delivering is a one hour talk. It's going to be highly engaged. We're going to have uh, 3000 people in the audience and that's what we're paying for. Right. And now uh, I think that uh, you've got a situation where the big events are being postponed. Mm -hmm. People are looking at maybe doing an even bigger event in 2021 and they just canceled their 2020 event, right? Mm -hmm. Like you think about like an association, for example, but they still have the challenge of they've got to deliver value for their people leading up to that. So now instead of saying, here's the price for a one hour keynote, what we're saying is here's the price for an engagement package between now and then that includes the one hour keynote, but also includes a webinar leading up to it. Also includes something that you can share with your audience beforehand to demonstrate that you're still providing value for them. So like, that's really important to think outside of just here's the, here's the keynote and that's it. Right. Right. Especially for associations that are very much struggling to serve their members in a time, especially if they have to cancel a large event. I know that our very own national speakers association, they're debating whether or not they're going to have influence, yes or no, and they're packing in a lot of value between now and August because they're really not sure. And I love that uh, you, you then could be a part of the equation for an association that's really trying to hang on to its members. Yeah. And you know, it's uh, one of the things that I think has, has benefited a speaker like me is uh, I'm a very content-based speaker. I mean, I've mm -hmm. written a ton of books. I teach a lot of classes. I have modules. I have classes. I have insights. So although I may offer inspiration in my talk, I'm not purely an inspirational or motivational speaker. I'm very content-oriented, mm -hmm. right? And very action-oriented right. in terms of here's what you do with it. And this model works really well for me because I don't just have that one inspirational talk. I mean, I have three different talks based on these books that I've done over the last 10 years. They're about trust. They're about trends. They're about thinking different. Like, and so I have a lot of material to be able to say to someone, here's the package of these three things and they're all going to be different. It's not the same as 
uh, as what you're going to hear if you just get that one talk. Right. Nice. Okay. So let's break down what the difference might be. What mistakes do you see speakers making when delivering virtual keynotes? Now we're setting aside webinars and other things that might be more interactive because we've got other podcasts that are specifically on those. So when it comes to delivering a virtual keynote per se, what would you say uh, mistakes that could happen would be? I think that one of the things is we forget some of the basics that we knew beforehand. So you have a speaker who would never get on stage and apologize for, you know, whatever's happening, right? They would just jump into their story. But as soon as technology gets introduced, we're apologizing for the camera. We're apologizing for the sound. We're apologizing for everything. And it's not an empowering way to start a talk. And so I see that all the time. Like people are like, well, I'm sorry that we have to do it this way. Or I'm sorry that like we can't be there together in person. And I'm like, yeah, we get it. Like, of course we'd want to be there together, but like, we don't need you to apologize for it. Like engage us with what you're going to say and your stories and not apologize. That's like opening with, it's a great day here in New York. Okay. We all know that we're in New York. You don't have to talk about it. Just go. Exactly. Like just give us something. Right. And I think the other thing, the other big thing that I think about is um, the theater of a stage talk, which I love Mm -hmm. uh, is theater because you can lead up to it. And it's sort of like watching a movie. Whereas a virtual keynote to me is much more like watching the trailer. You don't lead up to the stuff. You show them the best stuff right away. And a lot of people hate trailers because they give away the whole movie. Mm -hmm. But in a virtual keynote, like that's what you're doing, giving away the whole movie in a shorter period of time. And so all of my virtual keynotes tend to be 20, 25 minutes, not 45 minutes. Because 45 minutes is a big ask for someone to just sit there and engage with somebody on video. And so the nature of what I'm sharing has to go faster. It has to have a faster pace and I have to jump people into something much quicker instead of a more longer drawn out story that might demonstrate humanity and make me more likable and do all of those things, but it doesn't work in a virtual context. Okay. So you're trimming your stories? Trimming or killing. (laughs) You're like, I'm changing the stories. Yeah. So I have an entirely entirely different opening. I mean, I'm one of those guys, I mean, for just a little inside knowledge on how I do my talks, right? So I have a core talk, the non, you know, the non-obvious talk, which is all about thinking different. And I have probably 400 slides that are possible slides that I might use. And in a 45 minute keynote, I'll generally use about a hundred slides. So I'm only using a quarter of what I have. And part of what I have is I have, uh, I think uh, 14 different opening stories that I would have used on stage. And now that I'm doing them virtually, I have another six that I just added, which are totally different than the other 14 because they go faster. And because in some cases they use the interactivity, like I might use, In a real life talk, I would never show a video in the first 10 minutes because you give up your stage time to the video. You don't want to do that. But in an interactive conversation, I can bring in video much more quickly and much earlier because they're still engaging with me and they have multiple screens and they have multiple things, right? So the nature of like... What do you think the max of a video might be? In that situation. Depends, it depends on how you use the video. I mean, I have some videos where I'm talking over the video, ah. in which case, like, there's no max, right? No because max. they're watching the video and they're mm-hmm. listening to me and I still have their yeah. audience, right? Uh, I wouldn't show them a five-minute video. That would be, okay. you know, that'd be too much. Maybe two? Um, yeah, even two minutes is a long time to watch a video, right? I mean, yeah. I think maybe 90 seconds is about the, the limit. Okay. And I do have one video that's 90 seconds that is, uh, that is perfect like as a, as a piece because I talk over various points of it, but then you get to see what's happening. And then I have another piece that I actually haven't done yet, so I'm always experimenting. Okay. But I will do this where I have, it's almost like a stop start where it's like you watch part of the video, then we stop it. Hey, did you see what happened there? Right. And then we keep going and then we stop it again. Hey, whatever, what about here? Right? So, so like that... So when it comes to how do I figure out how to be more interactive with my audience, I mean, you just demonstrated something right there because I have to pay attention because you're asking me, did you see what happened there? And so I can't be multitasking or doing something else while I'm watching this. And I'm, I'm thinking that you're kind of engaging people in very unique and innovative ways. Okay, so we've got videos for engagement. You've got stories for engagement. You tighten up your stories and potentially drop some. Uh, what about your pacing? Is your pacing like 
a little more um, energized in this type of situation? I mean, you definitely cannot be a talking head or people will be falling asleep, right? Yeah, you definitely uh, move pacing back and forth. You can actually control on your own whether you show full screen video of yourself or whether you put yourself in the corner and show them the slide full screen. Right. Um, it takes a little sort of navigation, right? So to be like going to back and forth, if that's an option, that's kind of fun to see you. Yeah, there's actually some really then- cool, um, yeah, there's some cool technology that's almost like a single button thing. So you have like screencast and you set up four different screens right. and then you just press the button and it goes to a different screen, right? So you can yeah. get pretty sophisticated with right. it yourself. And then just kind of learn how to do it. And almost, it's almost like um, being a musician, right? So I play drums. And, uh, and when you play drums, like one of the core things of being a drummer is your right hand can do something different than your left hand, which is doing mm-hmm. something different than your right foot and your left foot. Like you have that coordination to do all of those things, right? Right. And this is almost becoming like that in terms of like move this over here, move that over there. Like it's kind of cool. So I know we're probably intimidating a few people who maybe aren't as tech savvy. So if you're not tech savvy, you don't have to set yourself up for a lot of technology. My husband, what you just said, he would go crazy because he can only do one thing at a time. Yeah. <laughs> I think women are a little bit more used to like yeah. 20 plates at once. But anyway, that's aside. So um Let's and by the way, I'm not, uh, I don't always do it all myself. Sometimes I sure. have someone else who's kind of doing the technical side. So also, uh, like one of the cool things about a virtual keynote is if I mention something that's like, oh, check out this site or check out this video, mm-hmm. when I have someone who's managing the chat, they can put the link to the video right there. They're and now if that. people have multiple screens, they can look at that and they can multitask at the same time. Right, right. They really do in the room in a live event. Okay. So, um, I think that standing up is the only way, the only option for a virtual keynote. What do you think about that? I think that speakers stand up because the energy is better. Mm -hmm. I think that you can bring the energy when you're sitting down. Mm -hmm. It's just harder. Uh, But it depends. I mean, it depends on the setup that you've got. It depends on what's more comfortable. If I'm like navigating and moving stuff around, like with my fingers, on the laptop and stuff. It's hard to do that when you're standing up unless you kind of raise the different desk level and stuff like that. So uh, sometimes I will stand and I'll do it more kind of to the camera like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. In a studio, obviously you're always standing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But when I'm doing something at home, that's more like webinar style. I'll usually be sitting. Right. Right. That's kind of how I distinguish the two is sitting down. You'd obviously be doing a webinar style in interaction. So talk about interaction for a keynote, what would be, what would you be doing to grab the audience and have them, do you have them communicate to you through chat or something like that? And are you checking on that? How does that work for you? It's hard to do that without getting distracted as a Mm -hmm. speaker. Uh, So I don't monitor the chat while I'm speaking because then people will just see me kind of, you know, doing this and they're like, what are you looking at? Like, what what is that? (laughs) <laughs> um, and I have a second screen here, right? But like, you know, you don't want to demonstrate that. Right. Um, so instead what I'll do is I'll, sometimes I'll integrate polls. So there's polling software. So you can Love literally that. show somebody something on the screen and say, click the one that you think like, so I have this one part where I talk about how it's hard to distinguish real media from fake media. And I show them a couple of different headlines and I say, which one's real. <sighs> And so they have to pick and then they see the okay. results and they see what other people chose. And so, and that's just software that's integrated into the, into the platform, depending on what platform we use. So like, and you can do that in a live talk too, right? I mean, people mm-hmm. have done that in live talks as well, but like sometimes okay. I'll do that sometimes to make it more interactive. Like one thing that people never do is like, like they don't move the camera. Like, look, I could take this camera and I could show you my entire bookshelf okay. over here, right? Like there's the whole bookshelf. And like, yeah. now you know that like, this isn't a virtual background behind me, right? Like this right. is, this is a, a real thing because here we are in a real room and I just showed you what the, what he's going to be so smart. Cause he's read all of those books. <laughs> cover to cover. Yeah, of course I have. <laughs> <laughs> now that's really, uh, I like your office setup and it looks very professional with, uh, the cubes kind of behind you there. So Ikea. <laughs> nice. So thinking about, uh, platforms, 
Uh, obviously, boy, I wish I would have bought stock in Zoom about th- four months ago, but I don't know. I don't know if they'll be able to maintain, but they definitely are at a peak right now. I hear about it all the time on all of the news agencies have mentioned Zoom and they've gotten more free, free publicity right now. What platform would you do a virtual keynote on or does it matter? It really doesn't matter uh, that much. What matters more are the features that you need. So for example, if you need a feature where you can see multiple people on video at the same time and you're doing Mm -hmm. it more discussion oriented, you need a platform that allows you to manage that uh, without affecting the latency or making it uh, unwatchable for anybody. Right. Uh, if you're doing it more like a recorded studio talk, which you're then distributing, then you might allow people to watch it on demand. And then you might integrate a chat feature where people can put the chats and the questions and stuff. And then one of the programs that I'm doing with a group of other speakers is all of us are coming together and we're basically each doing our live talk mm-hmm. to studio. So we're going in studio, do recording it, distributing that to the, to the client, and then we're showing up for a live Q&A afterwards. So I the talk that. is pre-recorded, but then you know that you'll be able to engage with each speaker live from this time to this time. And so some of, and this is for kind of big companies, and so some of the big companies, people will be able to watch it and show up for the live thing, and other people will just watch it on demand if they're in another country or a different time zone or whatever. They just watch right. it on demand, and they can kind of see the live Q&A afterwards but not participate, and that's you know an alternative. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. Now, that doesn't mean that I really believe that connection has an immense value for groups. You know, I meet with my groups, uh, Brady Bunch style, you know, with 10 of us on the screen. But when we get together face to face live, there is nothing like it. So do you, what do you think is going to happen long term now that we've kind of get this technology down a little bit better than we used to have it, what do you think this will mean for the industry long term? I, what I'm watching most is uh, that events will not be in person or virtual uh, in exclusion. They'll be hybrid events. Yeah. And I think that's what's going to happen to every event. So now you're going to have a smaller, perhaps, group of people in the room mm-hmm. because not as many people will just show up, but more people participating online. And then you'll have certain sessions that are in the room only sessions, certain sessions that are virtual only, and then some that are a blend between them. And you'll be able to sell tickets that way too, if it's a paid event, uh, because people will know that they'll be able to participate. That's one thing. The other thing that I think a lot of events have not done very well is monetize and distribute their archive. Because a lot of these events uh, are recording these sessions, but then they do nothing with them. And they either do what Ted does, which is they record everything. And then like a year or two later, they release it Mm -hmm. according to some strange schedule that nobody's even heard of, (laughs) Uh, or they don't release it at all. And they just literally sits there. And now you're sitting on this beautiful archive of stuff Mm -hmm. that you could either sell or just make available for people. Mm-hmm. I mean, South by Southwest, which I participate in and do a featured session at every year. And unfortunately this year was canceled. Yeah. So much great video. And, and look, if you go to that event, right. And I know, cause I checked the schedule, there's 28 sessions in each time slot. Wow. So there's no way you could possibly go to everything that you're interested in. Yeah. And it would be amazing to be able to get this archive of all of this stuff and access to it, but like we can't, right? And there's so much opportunity around this that I think is missing. Like why isn't uh, the NFL releasing a new channel for every team where I can just go and watch every good game for my team that generally has sucked for the last 10 years so I can relive how they used to be awesome in the 80s and win Super Bowls. (laughs) And I would just go and watch all that old stuff and I'd pay for that. You should, uh, that's a great idea. I love that. I think, I think there's a lot, I think you're onto this massive opportunity for content to be repurposed and brought out in different ways. And, uh, I think you're right that there's going to be a hybrid going forward. It won't be one or the other. And I'm glad to hear you say that you don't think in-person meetings are going to go away altogether. Um, I don't think so either because I just think that the level of connection is too great. Well, and I think that one thing that we've all been reminded by with this whole remote working thing is that it's actually nice to be in the office. And the biggest benefit I think that will come from this is the employers that were generally super negative on letting anybody work remotely at all ever 
right. are going to now start opening up. And so, I mean, it would be an amazing world if everyone could work remotely one day a week, mm-hmm. go into the office the other time. So I'm not saying, because some people hate working remotely. They don't like it. They don't like being in their own space. They like going into the office. That yeah. It's hard. But if we started working remotely one day a week, one of the things that would happen is we wouldn't do virtual meetings anymore. Because you do the meetings when you're in the office and you'd mm-hmm. work when you're out of the office. So like the awesome thing about having every Friday working from home is no meetings because now you're doing real work. Right. And you, and like everybody, you probably get way more done. I've only ever worked under the roof of, you know, I worked at 3M and places like that. But in my in entrepreneurial history, you know, an office of 30 people you've got so many um, things that distract you from your work that you are 10 times more productive in your home. Well, I am anyway, uh, being away from the office, all the water cooler chit chat and, oh, somebody just dropped off a thing of donuts and oh my goodness. So anyway, I I don't mind that at all. Okay. So let's talk really quickly. I would like to encourage people to stand tall in their value when it comes to pricing these things. I, uh, what I see in the industry right now is just a flood of content coming out upon us. And I really think that a lot of people are probably feeling a little bit of uh, like webinar fatigue or content fatigue. We're just being rained down upon. People are sending me things here, share this with all your people, share this with all your people. And we've got plenty um, coming to us. So, Talk about pricing for this. I've heard people say, you know, for a virtual, you're going to go less on pricing than your normal fee. But if you're providing uh, a virtual studio as well, I think you have to really think about whether or not that's going to put your fee up. Yeah, I think, uh, look, we don't, uh, so far what I've seen is if we're doing that with the virtual studio and, Mm -hmm. and we're doing that entire setup and we're delivering a lot of value, we're not actually lowering the fee at all. What we're maybe doing is delivering more for it. Uh, And what I mean by that is the virtual studio and the talk, like I mentioned before is one aspect. Mm -hmm. The other aspect may be that we're also integrating a webinar leading up to Right. That talk, right. We're right. also integrating maybe some digital content in terms of like excerpts and, and downloads and stuff like that. Right. So it becomes more of a package that's sold as opposed to a single talk. Right. Uh, but again, it's all about the value, right? If we can provide that much value within that same budget, I think there are a lot of companies that are looking at that and saying, look, this is what we would have spent on a speaker. Right. Now we no longer have the hotel expenses. We no longer have the travel expenses. We no longer have the food expenses, right? So we can, you know, we may not be able to increase our speaker budget, but at the very least we can keep it the same if we're going to get all this value mm-hmm. and fill all of this content and all of this programming. That's what I love. Uh, I've been doing a good news uh, post on Facebook now for five weeks. And this last week, someone said that three of their engagements turned virtual for the same fee. And I love that because... Yeah, we had the same thing. Yeah, I, I think that, that um, it, you know, what you'll do to kind of anything, and, and, and it shouldn't be less anyway, but you are sometimes not having to go out of your, away from your home for three days, which is a beautiful thing. And I like the idea of... Uh, you're just building up your value to kind of uh, make up for anything that you, the client may feel that should be discounted. I don't know. Yeah, and you know, it's, um, if for, for me, it's always been, I mean, this is not really a change from what I did when we were doing live events. Mm-hmm. Also, every event is sort of a case by case basis. And I'm looking at some of these events and saying, look, if you have an audience of a hundred thousand people that are in that network, and we can work out a way for me to provide enough value to get a lot of them to join my email list because I do this weekly email, mm-hmm. uh, you know, every Thursday. And it's it's a it's a lot of stories that are compiled and the most interesting things of the week. And I spend a lot of time on it, and there's a huge value in it. If I can drive a lot of subscribers for that, that's value for me, right? 
that now I can take and uh, and and put in as this package, and maybe we negotiate something different. So, mm-hmm. it's not that I would never take less than what my fee is, right? Mm-hmm. The question is, what's the package that's going to make the most right. sense? Is there uh, an element of this that that I can really do something beneficial for them? Is it an audience that has high value? Like all of those things are things that we would look at otherwise as well, right? So, you know, it's not like a hard and fast. Like if it isn't this, then we never do it. That's never been the case for me, at least. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, when it comes, I just want to ask you one more question about actually delivering a virtual keynote, and then uh, we'll wrap up. When it comes to humor, what, how do you, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to hear the laugh. And I've been watching all these shows that, uh, you know, all the late night hosts and without the laugh track, it's funny how things are or aren't funny. Yeah. How do, do you pause to let people laugh? Do you laugh at it yourself? How do you make humor funny in a virtual event? Laughing at your own jokes is never funny. Um, so <laughs> that's, you don't do that. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, one of the benefits that, that I have as a speaker, and I think other speakers who've done a lot of talks, I mean, before this whole thing happened, I was doing 50 talks a year. Mm-hmm. And so there's content that I have that I know is funny. Yes. And so when I'm delivering that content, I know people are laughing, even though I, I don't hear it, right? I never had a laugh track, right? I only ever had a live audience. And so right. I know what's funny. So do you pause? Sometimes I'll pause, but not for a crowd to laugh, yeah. right? I'll pause for someone to laugh. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe I'll smile along with it and then I'll keep moving. But the way, the style that I'll use probably in a virtual keynote is much more like uh, if you ever watch like English comedy, mm-hmm. uh, like British comedy moves really fast and they don't pause for any laughs. Right. They just know you're laughing, but they keep going. Right. right. It's, very, it's very quick. It's quick witted. It's, it's funny. And it's like, you just, you, you, you just keep going. And, and I think that that style is probably what I use a little more in a virtual keynote, whereas it's a little more, it's a lot more theatrical on the stage. Okay. All right. And we're going to uh, offer up a sample to show people kind of how it looks when you do deliver a virtual keynote. Now, if people want to get in touch with you, or if they'd like to be on your Thursday list, what should people do? Super easy. Just go to my personal website. It's rohitbargava.com. Uh, and if you want to subscribe, it's just rohitbargava.com slash subscribe. Or you can go to the non-obvious website and get like excerpts of all the different books that I mentioned. There's a, you know, I showed you before, like there's this trend book here. There's also a bunch of different guides. So like this is one of the guides for like marketing and there's a whole section on there on PR and and email marketing and everything related to that. There's all of that stuff is on nonobvious.com. And if you go to nonobvious.com slash subscribe, you can subscribe there too. Okay, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise and wisdom. And, you know, there's one thing that you said before we started the call about how, well, what do you think it is that's keeping you calm in this crazy time? (laughs) I think that, I mean, the thing I shared with you, which I think is true, is because I spend so much time around innovative and disruptive ideas, and I Mm -hmm. teach people how to embrace the disruption, uh, when my life and my work gets disrupted, I'm not paralyzed by that. Uh, I know that I can try something different. I know that I can do something different. And so like one of the examples I love to to share is like everybody, when this whole thing started and and our incomes started going down, people were worried about like, how am I going to make money? Right. And almost immediately I made $500 and I made $500 by finding an old iPhone in my house and finally selling it on eBay. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, so I think that the lesson for me there was like, let's separate, I got to make money from what am I going to do strategically to make myself stronger and smarter to right. make my business better prepared for the future. Like that's what I hope people can pivot to start thinking about. Yes, of course we need to make money, but there's ways to do that while not cannibalizing what we do or changing everything. Or like you said, cutting prices entirely or just doing everything for free and hoping that everything comes back. Like that's never 
been the case because you set the new expectation and that's not what we want to do either. Yeah. I think that's a lo- that doesn't serve you long-term fear-based decisions right now are not going to uh, serve you long-term. Well, thank you for that uh, wisdom about not being paralyzed. I really wanted you to share that with the audience because I think when we pivot and move forward calmly, uh, we're doing our brand a good service. So thank you, Rohit, for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for the great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And for those of you listening in, please let us know that you've appreciated it. Leave us a comment, a review, a rating. Make sure you subscribe to not miss out on the great podcasts that are coming your way. With that, we will say, see you soon, Wealthy Speakers. Bye for now, everyone. Hey, thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed our show, you'll want to come and visit us at the Wealthy Speakers School, where we provide a proven roadmap for building your dream business. Go to WealthySpeakerSchool.com. And for show notes for today's podcast, head on over to SpeakerLauncher.com and click on podcast. I'll see you soon, Wealthy Speakers.